461, chapters 89, 90, and 91 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 2632. Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 461, Suivez-moi. This episode of Craplet is brought to you by Embody Focus. Find out more at embodyfocus.com slash craftlet. Whoo, doggy, do I have a good show for you today. So it's huge. It's epic. It's going to take you two settings minimum to listen to everything, but you will understand when you get to the end. And I know I sound like a broken record on this, but we're getting close to the end of the book. You will understand why I had to play three chapters for you. So good. So good. The whole episode is chock full of so good. First, I didn't do anything particularly crafty this week, but my friend Katie did, and she is going to share with you in a conversation with me what she's been up to and what might be of benefit to you as well. Second, we have two voicemails from two genius listeners who are going to be so vindicated by the end of today's episode and then finally three chapters for you one two three just like that one katie two voicemails three chapters i love it when that happens so here's my conversation with katie and i need to let you know katie and i talked for much longer than what you're going to hear here so if something doesn't make a hundred percent sense it's because i had to cut out a story that she told or something like that. And because her stories were all really good, I have made an extra episode. So if you want to hear more, you know, if you're trying to kill time between now and when the next chapters come out, you can listen to episode 461B. That is a bonus episode for you. That is the entire conversation between Katie of Embody Art and me. All right, here's the excerpt of our conversation. Here we go. One of the reasons I wanted to bring you on to the show this week is because you have a special thing that you are doing for the month of July and for Craftlet listeners. So that's very exciting. But one of the reasons that I thought that what you're doing is a good fit for Craftlet people is because everybody who listens to Craftlet is creative somewhere or another. There's some something that they do, whether it's science or math or knitting or quilting. Everybody does something. They're all creators. And you are a very different kind of creator than other people that we've talked to on the podcast before. So I thought it would be interesting for everybody to get a chance to hear from you how, how you went from kind of traditional business work-life land into what you're doing now, which is so completely different. I guess the part that the start is that I, out of school, two things. One, I was a religion major, Mm. which no one really expects. No, that's so cool. (laughs) Yeah. And two, um, I was an actress right out of school. So people used to say, and every now and then, why are you, even now they'll say like, so why did you, why were you a religion major? And like, were you going to be a nun? You know, they'll say things like that. And right. So the answer is, first of all, for especially applicable to craft lit people, a religion major is reading and writing. Yep. That's a religion major. You just, it's just that what you're reading and writing is really, for me, completely fascinating, interesting, philosophical, theological stuff. Right. But you would learn to be a good reader and writer. The other thing that was really relevant for acting is that, not unlike the stories that you read, it's the study of what people believe in. It's about what makes characters tick. That's a religion major, believe it or not, because what do you believe in is who you are. So anyway, that was the answer to that little part of my life. So then when I came after, you know, a young adult, I turned out I really did not like the acting industry. Well, what happened was I started to fall in love with design. I, I was working on Max 
and I was just glued. So then I actually went and I got a real job and I ended up as a communication consultant, Whoa. which that's a real title, but I had a self-created position where I was a designer and a writer and an illustrator and a client, which you would call like um, in the ad world, a client manager. Right. Or I worked at Pricewaterhouse, which became PricewaterhouseCoopers. And I, I was like a little in-house ad agency. But then the merger was so hectic that they didn't know what to do with me. And my people told me to quit, collect unemployment. And I, I couldn't do it. I could just, I, it's, it was partly dignity. I think it was mostly dignity. But it was really just that feeling of, it's so not true. I can't do it. I cannot. Yeah. It's just like almost like a little mini crime because it's just simply not true. So I quit with no prospects. Right. At the end of that six months of me living off this 17, mythical $17,000, um, I, I seriously looked up and I had $14 in one bank account and $32 in the other. And that's it. And no, it's not like I had parents that would help me out. I know that sounds weird because they were still around, but they just simply did not either have it or wouldn't or out of the question. I had nobody. So that's what happened after that the same day. Oh, you got the phone call. Yes. That's I awesome. Did. I got a call from Pepsi. It was for a big, he ended up multi-six figure job. For Pepsi bottling group. I mean, this was the opportunity of a lifetime. This was right. So, so what, how long were you doing that before, before you realized that you'd gotten yourself into another situation that you needed to get out of? Oh, that's such the perfect way to put it. The perfect way. I'm good that way. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a breaking point. 2012 is when I, kind of took myself by the cojones, mm -hmm. the cojones. Mm -hmm. and I said something has to change like you this is ridiculous and what was ridiculous was that I was just I was making on paper decent money at the end of the year but I spent I've now been in business for myself 16 years so I spent years as if I was making nothing like I was so scrambling I would not know where the next month's rent was coming from and there's many reasons for this which are mostly humiliating but they're just <laughs> the truth <laughs> the truth will not just the truth will set you free the truth will humiliate you <laughs> but, but they we've do, all the been truth there does lead to amazing solutions when yes. you're willing to face it that's really one of the big big points you know, it's scary even telling you this stuff now. And it takes us like courage. You have to go a step at a time. But one thing I have definitely realized and learned from listening to other people is that the person who needs to hear this will really appreciate the mm -hmm. honesty of admitting oh, yeah. to screw ups. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise it's like it's like looking at Instagram feeds where you're like, wow, Everyone exactly. else has a perfect life and mine sucks really That's bad. Exactly right. And it's horrible. It it I think we've been talking about this a lot in the education world hmm. that teachers, parents, all of us, we say to kids all the time, like, well, it's okay that you made a mistake because you know how many times Thomas Edison screwed up on that light bulb and he a thousand tries later he finally got it to work. Yeah, but how do we grade kids? We don't yeah, grade them in a way that encourages that kind of experimentation. And life doesn't really encourage that kind of experimentation either. So the fact that you're willing to be honest about that stuff is, I think it's crucial. It's the only way anybody ever feels like they can do it too. I don't want to hear somebody Love else's it. success story. I like hearing how they got out of a hard place. Oh, now you're going to really encourage me. Ah. That's really good. That's really beautiful. And I do know what you mean. There's many different angles that I messed up on. I, I am a very organized person, and yet, <laughs> and yet, I thwarted myself, my own best skills. And um, I mean, I love, I'm an unusual mixture of loving 
and being very creative and still love, I'm a systems person. I'm, a, I'm an automation and systems expert now. I love Excel spreadsheets. Like who says that? Only math people say that, but I love But you're a math. design person, which makes you an interesting intersection of art and commerce and being able to use both sides of your brain. Bingo, exactly. Huge. Exactly. That's what I really, that's when I really thrive. And I think that's where creativity really thrives. And, you know, so it goes back to what you, what you were asking about when did I realize that things were crashing um, or needed to change. And if you work 10 years straight, basically without taking a vacation, a real mm -hmm. vacation, you're not, it's like a joke to say, you're not going to be as clear headed about your systems and your processes, you know, I mean, people need to honestly, ideally take a couple of vacations a year. That's why we have that system. But even if it's just every few years, something, you know, or something else that you do, which is what we're going to get into something you do that nurtures you. It doesn't necessarily have to be vacation. Vacation's fantastic. I highly endorse it, but it, you know, whatever it is you do that really feeds you, that isn't the same routine, even if you love your work passionately, just so that you do get that, you know, healthy interchange. And it's like a balance you need. It's not, you, even if you're a very extreme person, you still need balance. You just have to balance extremes. That's what I have found. That is a good way to put it. Yes. Yeah. You know, you, you help people go back and find their center. That is exactly why I'm doing this because it did do it for me and it can do it for others. Even, obviously it can do it for others because it did it for me. And it was so big. It was really what you've been talking about, you know, and I'm still hesitant to share how big it was because it's embarrassing. Honestly, I just feel embarrassed. And I realized what we said was true that people want to hear the failures. I get it, but it's still hard to share that. Well, it was, and it's, it's also that these kinds of things that you're talking about and the, the kinds of experiences that you've had that I've had that that you've seen more than just a few people have when they mm -hmm. they start to figure out how their how your systems fit with their work and their life and and the 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 way that you are very encouraging about not do it the way I do it that you start with the try it the way I do it if you're going to change something, don't change it just because, you know, there's the, what's going on. What's the reason behind it? Because you've you've pegged several times things, sing, things that I had bypassed that I didn't. I wasn't doing myself any favors by bypassing them. It was just a pressure point. It was a hard thing to figure out how to do. But I think the systems that you've figured out and that you've encouraged the growth of in other people are the kinds of things that I now look back and think if I could go back and teach all 10 years of high school students, these are things I would have changed in my classroom because I think that they're, they're life skills for the 21st century. They're not necessarily things that I would have thought of or needed to think of when I started teaching in 93. And I have a feeling that a lot of adults, because everything is going so fast, we start to feel out at sea. And I mean, we, all of us, people who are listening to the podcast, you, me, all of us, we're, we're really high functioning 21st century people because we have people who listen to podcasts there. You have what? 38% of the population of the United States knows what a podcast is. It's an incredibly small percentage, but that, that makes it even worse because it means we're at the front of the line and still struggling everybody else is behind us and and it makes such a a huge difference to know that it's not just throw up your hands and say oh crap well i guess life's just gonna suck well you know it's there's so you're making me think of so many different things but one of the things that you're making me think is that the reason people get into these constricted paths of what their life should be is because of what we're talking about because they're trying to survive. They're trying to figure out a way to make enough money to own a home and have a car and bring home food and, you know, survive and be relatively happy. But since that isn't rewarding for all of us, 
on the level that we've been talking about, like it has to be level, the playful level, the art level that I believe we all deserve to have, it can be more challenging. In the long run, it's actually easier because you're being true to yourself. But that's why I know that I actually know how to create systems to help that super original creative person. And it's, you don't have to be super original, it'll help anybody, but it's really for somebody who wants to chart their own path and it can feel like chaos. It can just feel like, yeah. how do I, you know, things are just flying everywhere. There's just like, how do you get a grip? I, and that is that is exactly what it feels like before <laughs> before you start to figure these things out. And I, I am sure that people who have been listening to the podcast for several years can probably go back in time and figure out when I met you. <gasps> I am reasonably, in fact, I will put out a challenge to everyone and say, wow. if you can figure out where in the, in the book lineup things changed in in my world put it in the comments what an honor because i have i have a feeling there are several people who are paying attention who will who will know and that is such an honor and it's going to be really interesting to see what they have to say because uh everybody's real smart but you <laughs> but you aren't doing this just by yourself anymore you've got rianne who is also an expert you have you who are the systems expert and you also have done something very special for the craftwork community that we should tell them about. Uh, yes. So I have created a special little giveaway for Yay. craft litters. Craft litters? Yeah. Not litterers, craft litters. I have had the hardest time figuring out mm. what to call everybody. Yeah. I do craft litters on Twitter because it's shorter. Okay. It's just a special free handout called How to Create Your Own Bliss Day. So I started referring to my Fridays, which are one of the main days. That's my main yoga class. I have now, I have multiple yoga classes. Yay. I even have a private yoga instructor. Dude. Yeah, he is a dude. You're so cool. <laughs> yeah. He's a really cool dude and I'm cool to have him. That's true. Yeah. Okay. So um, I started telling people casually. First, I started saying I'm in bliss after yoga class. And then it became, it's Friday is my bliss day because what happened was like you, we were talking a little earlier, but I'll just recap because it's worth sharing and you'll see it on the giveaway that's for the craft lit people. My whole schedule fell into place because of yoga class. Cause what happened was then I had a client call that needed to happen that day. So it had to go early and it was, I'm not a morning person traditionally. So I, but I was willing and happily willing to make it earlier than I would normally. And then I had to get up even earlier because I had to be ready for the call. So that here I was, oh my God, I'm acting like a responsible person. How did that happen? How so, did I get to be a grown like, up? Okay, don't tell anyone. Cause Something's you know, I'm like, wrong. that's sick. But yeah. in the beginning. And then I had enough time to do a little piece of work after that. And then I had to run off to yoga. So right away, right, that right there, great formula because I, f I didn't feel like a screw up for running off to yoga because I'd already gotten good work done. But it's Friday where people are all feeling like, yay, it's the weekend. So then I go to yoga, total bliss. Then it turns out on my way home from yoga, Trader Joe's is right there. So, oh my God, all my shopping, groceries, dilemma, no problem. I go to Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's is very affordable. For I love members. Trader no. Joe's. They're great. So, and then even better, Trader Joe's has very affordable flowers and I've always wanted weekly fresh flowers. So I'm like, you know what, let's get them. I can splurge because they're not very expensive. So I started getting fresh, fresh flowers and then there's more and there's more. I added, I, I only drink on weekends. So I made myself um, drink only on weekends for health. It's just more balance again. So then I get to have beautiful red wine after, and I'm already, you know, I've had good exercise. So the toxins are on their way out. So I get to have great red wine. And then I've got really beautiful food from Trader Joe's and I can wind down from the whole week. And that became, it, it's just heaven. That is my bliss day. So I, I, I started telling people, men and women, and they all seemed to respond really nicely to it. They were like, oh, I want a bliss day too. So I was, I was so I created just now for craft lit people, how to make your own bliss day. And just a simple cheat sheet of 
you know, what questions to ask yourself so that because yours might look completely different from mine. You can start with I have the example of mine there just in case. I like that you did that on the on the page where people can sign up for the download thing that yeah. you, you have your your answers. Yes. On the page so they can see them. I love that. Good. That's just to give people viewers yeah. an idea of, you know, just a jump start idea. Yeah. It's a starting you point. Know. Yeah. To look at. But so it's just a simple, anyway, it is embodyfocus.com slash bliss, B-L-I-S-S. And you'll get the instructions as soon as you go there. It's all very clear. I thought so too. And I think that the the other thing I wanted to make sure that everybody knew about was that if if this is intriguing, if the whole idea of finding a system that works for them and working with somebody who like gets what it means to be a creative, a creative genius, but you know, a, a, a creative mind that has to work within a, a routinely non-creative world that, that there's, there are answers and that they can, they can come to you and find out what's going on. Cause you guys are starting this, this new embody focus. That's it's, right. It's a, it's a mastermind. It's a course. It's an everything that you and Rianne are doing. And what website do they go to if they want to read more about that part? That they can just get at embodyfocus.com. Okay. So it's right there. That's the page. That's the page that you have that you built. That's so gorgeous. That just goes Thank with you. all the chunks. So people can really yes. see laid out what's there. That's right. So just in case it's M body, E M B O D Y focus, F O C U S. Com. And I'll put that in the show notes as oh, well okay, so great, that there's, there are direct links to both of those for everybody. And the special little giveaway is just that slash bliss. Good. Yeah. Thank you so much for mentioning it. It's a great, it's a really one incredible opportunity to be able to describe the path that got me there. That's so rewarding. It feels so good to be able to just tell people that this was a real human being with a re real struggles real problems, you know, and some of those you may very well relate to because I've talked to plenty of people who do and it really can change your life and your, and if you're an entrepreneur, it can also seriously change your business and your money. Yeah. Cause everything you do is related to the money that you bring in. I know. And it's so hard. Um, if you, if you grew up in an academic world, which you and I both did, that can be a really weird shift mindset shift mm -hmm. to, to go through and I know we have a lot of a lot of educators uh also are listening but, ah. I, but I thought I thought your story was pretty interesting and it's it's so hard to hear anybody's genesis story without it sounding like it's perfect yeah you know you listen to Richard Branson and you go oh yeah well that sure you screwed up you know right. <laughs> bad chance yeah. So it's, I, I think it's important for us to remember that there's both a light at the end of the tunnel, but also that the, the things that are difficult and challenging are often the places that we learn the most quickly. On my main website, I have on my about page something, I may phrase it a little differently, but it's you're best at whatever you're worst at. It, this is really profound and I believe true. So an example, I'm going to really out myself here. Like I can actually even feel tears. That's oh, how no. real this is. Wow. For me, it's communication. So I'm a communication consultant. They gave me that title and it turned out to be true. And I know from the feedback I get that I am a good communicator. And I know that I do very well with language and words. And I love them passionately. However, it is also a big struggle for me. I have struggled and I continue to, but I've learned a lot to communicate effectively, especially with the people closest to me. And it has caused me a lot of heartbreak and it's still a great journey because I'm not, I don't, you know, I've learned so much. That's really what you need is you just need perseverance and courage. But the reason, I just want to say, the reason that you are 
best at what you're worst at. It isn't some weird, it feels like a weird trick of the universe. Right. But the reason it's true is because whatever that thing is, I don't care if it's food. I don't care if it's, I don't know, it could be anything that you think you're terrible at, but you also have a passion for it. The reason that it's that weird mix is because it's got you. Like to someone else who's, who's, you know, okay at it or fine at it, it doesn't have them. It didn't grab them like the same, you know? So whatever that thing is, that's like got you, that's, you stand the chance of being a genius at that thing. Hmm. The big if is if you're willing, if you're willing to confront it, to face it and to, to wrestle with it, basically look your demons in, in the eyes. Yeah. What a great place to end for a religion major. <gasps> You just get me chills and it's really hot. I know. <laughs> Another like, you know, seeming completely impossible <laughs> mixture of things. <laughs> this is so great. I am so glad we did this. Yeah, you're amazing. Oh, so are you. So, you know, mutual admiration society. Totally. Yay. A real one for sure. So I hope you take a minute or two to go over and grab your Build Your Bliss Day downloadable at Embody Art dot com slash bliss and again it's e m b o d y a r t dot com you can also go to craftlit dot com slash bliss and get all the links you need and information to katie's work and what she's been up to right there on the craftlit site hi heather this is anita uh well knit life on ravelry and I'm calling about chapter 85, so I haven't listened to the most recent chapter to load, so you may have already had a comment about this, but um, the way I interpreted the fishing trip and getting away from Paris at the key moment when the other newspaper was revealing uh, the, the key information that was going to take Fernand down was that he was actually more of an act of mercy, that he didn't have to be there when uh, this all happened. and. He could have just a little bit more time thinking that it was all gone and the problem was uh, taken care of. So that's, that's how I interpret it. I didn't actually think that it was – I mean, I think <laughs> you have to take it as a given that uh, all of the conspirators have to go down. So he couldn't not uh, release the information that would set up everything that he seems to have uh, laid out, but he could at least soften the blow a little bit for um, – I'm sorry. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> the son's name. Anyway, um, the other little comment was many, 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 many chapters ago at the party, Mercedes asks uh, Edouard, now the Count of Monte Cristo, to eat something, drink something at her house, and uh, he refuses. And that really was reminiscent to me of this idea in India, very, very backward in my opinion, idea that some people have that, you know, once your daughter marries, uh, if you, even if you go to visit her, you will not even drink water, uh, at her house. And that was, that, that, that was very much, uh, someone who that said, now she's gone from his life, he will not even drink water at her house. He's, he's relinquished her in that way. Uh, and I think, you know, if she takes that way, then of course that would be especially painful. Uh, since she seems to know, uh, seems to know. Uh, anyway, that's it. I'm sorry for the car noise in the background, a little bit of a busy street, uh, but I just, I had a minute to talk, so I would, thought I would leave the message. Love the podcast. Bye. So we're going to hear more about Edmond, the Count of Monte Cristo, not eating at Mercedes' house today. And I didn't say anything about it at the time, but now that Anita said this, I had thought when I heard the Count of Monte Cristo not eating. The first thing that had come to my mind was a not eating in fairy land environments. There's something that popped up in Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell. It pops up in lots and lots of stories. I think it even popped up on True Blood that if you are in fairy country, and I do mean little, you know, flying fairies that can be really, really nasty tricksters, you are not supposed to eat or drink anything because you get trapped there. And if you haven't read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell, I haven't mentioned it for years, but wow, amazing book, huge book, read it on a Kindle. You won't be as intimidated. I think it might actually be bigger than The Count of Monte Cristo. And today we hit chapter, well, in 
chapter 91, we hit page 1000 in my copy of the book, just so you can be really proud of yourself for having stuck around this long. So yeah, the, the whole uh, getting trapped by eating or drinking something at somebody's house or not wanting to take anything offered generously from someone who is your enemy. There's a lot of stories where this is an overlay to actions that people either do or don't take. Okay, and then we have our voicemail from our fabulous Ken in Honolulu. Ken, who has been so insightful about motivations, especially when it comes to characters like Danglar. Oh, Ken, are you going to be patting yourself on the back by the end of the chapters today? All right, here we go with Ken's voicemail. Hi, this is Ken from Honolulu. I find it interesting to think that you think that Monte Cristo was the one that put the information in the paper to really mess up Ferdinand. I don't think so. I think it was Dunglar because of the fact that Monte Cristo told him earlier, oh, well, don't you have people that can check this out to make sure that this is what actually happened? And Monte Cristo may have been the architect of it, but I don't think he's the one that did it. If you look in his past history, he's the one that he – tells other people to do stuff and they do it so i think it was more him and also dunglar has a real bone to pick with ferdinand because he bought his name and title and dunglar figures that he got his you know in a different way so it might be that i think it was dunglar that he got that information from but also it's kind of interesting that people seem to forget that Monte Cristo, right after he was rescued, when he escaped from the prison, and um, they got to the shore, and they went to a bar or a tavern, and he looked around him, and he said, when he was very young, as Edmund, he says, oh, if these men just had somebody that could guide them and get them together, they could be a real force to deal with. So he was one of the first masterminds of organized crime, if you want to put it that way. And I think that's where he's still getting a lot of his money, not just from the fact of the uh, Abbe having all this money, having all these jewels and money and everything hidden there on Monte Cristo. So it's just kind of interesting. Thank you. Bye. So if like Ken, you remembered the scene where recently released I put that in quotation marks, quotation marks with a giant grin on my face right after Edmund was released from the Chateau d'If. If you also remembered that scene in the bar, what I remember about it is that I spent an inordinate amount of time looking at Google Maps to find out if that location was still there. <laughs> and, and it is. And because I simply haven't changed. I just took a break so that I could go find the episode and chapter again. And actually, it's probably... Not a bad idea to go back and listen to that uh, that episode again. It is episode 416, covering chapters 21 and 22. Chapter 22 is the one in question. And I've actually lifted the text from the, uh, the Victorian translation, the Gutenberg translation, in case you wanted to see it. And that is in the show notes at craftlit.com slash 461. But yeah, Ken's right. And yeah, if you wanted to go back and listen to that episode, it's 416. So craftlit.com slash 416. And, uh, and you can hear about that. I also, again, because I don't change, I have linked to the Google map where you can find the wall that had housed the entrance to this particular tavern. And I also put a picture of the wall currently as far as google earth is concerned where you or google maps where you can do the street view <laughs> because i am a big old geek is what it comes down to so yay ken thank you so much i always look forward to hearing from you and from everyone if you have something to say please call area code 206 350-1642 or go to the website and you will see a little tabby in the right hand edge of your screen. It'll say send voicemail and that is how you can connect with SpeakPipe 
and it'll send me a file and I'll be able to play it. Or actually, Justin will be able to play it for you because he's awesome and he's editing. You don't need anything from me except this. The line that became the title of this episode, Suivez-moi, Suivez-moi, that is a line from William Tell, the big William Tell opera, the William Tell overture, William Tell opera. You're going to hear a reference to it right at the beginning. Suivez-moi means follow me, like follow me into the breach. And because, again, I am a big old geek, I went looking for this particular segment of William Tell, and I found a fabulous one. I have a link in the show notes that will take you to the moment that this section of the, I don't know, I don't know if it's an aria or not. It's a guy. I think guys can sing arias, right? I know nothing about opera, except that it's big and showy and has lots of amazing costumes. Um, William Tell, Wilhelm Tell, beautiful music. This section, you are going to recognize parts of it. And shortly after the fanfare that opens this segment of the song, aria, thing, somebody call and tell me what this is called. Uh, you will hear, suivez-moi, suivez-moi, follow me, follow me. And I know you'll know what it means. Yay. And also, of course, kind of perfect how it shows up in our chapter today. First chapter today of three. All right. No more waiting. It is time to listen to our three chapters. Here we go with chapters 89, 90, and 91 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, who just celebrated a birthday, um, posthumously, but nonetheless, a birthday. Here we go. Chapter 89, A Nocturnal Interview. Monte Cristo waited, according to his usual custom, until Dupré had sung his famous Suivez-moi. Then he rose and went out. Morel took leave of him at the door, renewing his promise to be with him the next morning at seven o'clock, and to bring Emmanuel. Then he stepped into his coupé, calm and smiling, and was at home in five minutes. No one who knew the Count could mistake his expression when, on entering, he said, Ali. "'Bring me my pistols with the ivory cross.' Ali brought the box to his master, who examined the weapons with a solicitude very natural to a man who is about to entrust his life to a little powder and shot. These were pistols of an especial pattern, which Monte Cristo had made for target practice in his own room. A cap was sufficient to drive out the bullet, and from the adjoining room no one would have suspected that the Count was, as sportsmen would say, keeping his hand in. He was just taking one up and looking for the point to aim at on a little iron plate which served him as a target when his study door opened and Baptistin entered. Before he had spoken a word, the Count saw in the next room a veiled woman who had followed closely after Baptistin, and now, seeing the Count with a pistol in his hand and swords on the table, rushed in. Baptistin looked at his master, who made a sign to him and he went out, closing the door after him. "'Who are you, madame?' said the Count to the veiled woman. The stranger cast one look around her, to be certain that they were quite alone, then bending as if she would have knelt, and joining her hands, she said with an accent of despair, "'Edmond, you will not kill my son!' The Count retreated a step, uttered a slight exclamation, and let fall the pistol he held." "'What name did you pronounce, then, Madame de Morcerf?' said he. "'Yours,' cried she, throwing back her veil. "'Yours, which I alone, perhaps, have not forgotten, Edmond. "'It is not Madame de Morcerf who is come to you. "'It is Mercedes.' "'Mercedes is dead, Madame,' said Monte Cristo. "'I know no one now of that name.' "'Mercedes lives, sir, and she remembers.' for she alone recognized you when she saw you, and even before she saw you, by your voice, Edmond, by the simple sound of your voice, 
and from that moment she has followed your steps, watched you, feared you, and she needs not to inquire what hand has dealt the blow which now strikes Monsieur de Morcerf. Fernand, do you mean? replied Monte Cristo with bitter irony. Since we are recalling names, let us remember them all. Monte Cristo had pronounced the name of Fernand with such an expression of hatred that Mercedes felt a thrill of horror run through her every vein. "'You see, Edmond, I am not mistaken, and have cause to say, spare my son.' "'And who told you, madam, that I have any hostile intentions against your son?' "'No one, in truth. But a mother has twofold sight. I guessed all. I followed him this evening to the opera, and concealed in a parquet box, have seen all. If you have seen all, madame, you know that the son of Fernand has publicly insulted me, said Monte Cristo with awful calmness. Oh, for pity's sake! You have seen that he would have thrown his glove in my face if Morel, one of my friends, had not stopped him. Listen to me. My son has also guessed who you are. He attributes his father's misfortunes to you. Madame, you are mistaken. They are not misfortunes. It is a punishment. It is not I who strike Monsieur de Morcerf. It is Providence which punishes him. And why do you represent Providence? cried Mercedes. Why do you remember when it forgets? What are Yanina and its vizier to you, Edmond? What injury has Fernand Mondego done you in betraying Ali Tepelini? Ah, madame, replied Monte Cristo, all this is an affair between the French captain and the daughter of Vasiliki. It does not concern you. If you are right, and I have, I have sworn revenge myself, it is not on the French captain or the Count of Morcerf, but on the fisherman Fernand, the husband of Mercedes the Catalane. Ah, oh, sir, cried the countess, how terrible a vengeance for a fault which fatality made me commit, for I am the only culprit, Edmond, and if you owe revenge to any one, it is to me, who had not fortitude to bear your absence and my solitude. But, exclaimed Monte Cristo, why was I absent? And why were you alone? Because you had been arrested, Edmond, and were a prisoner. And why was I arrested? Why was I a prisoner? I do not know, said Mercedes. You do not, madame. At least I hope not. But I will tell you. I was arrested and became a prisoner, because under the arbor of La Reserve, the day before I was to marry you, a man named Donglas wrote this letter, which the fisherman Fernand himself posted. Monte Cristo went to a secretary, opened a drawer by a spring from which he took a paper which had lost its original colour, and the ink of which had become a rusty hue. This he placed in the hands of Mercedes. It was Donglas's letter to the king's attorney, which the Count of Monte Cristo, disguised as a clerk from the house of Thompson and French, had taken from the file against Edmond Dante, on the day he had paid the two hundred thousand francs to Monsieur de Beauville, Mercedes read with terror the following lines. The king's attorney is informed by a friend to the throne and religion that one Edmond Dante, second in command on board the Ferroen, this day arrived from Smyrna, after having touched at Naples and Porto Ferraio, is the bearer of a letter from Murat to the usurper, and of another letter from the usurper to the Bonapartist club in Paris. Ample corroboration of this statement may be obtained by arresting the above-mentioned Edmond Dante, who either carries the letter for Paris about with him, or has it at his father's abode. Should it not be found in possession of either father or son, then it will assuredly be discovered, in the cabin belonging to the said Dante on board the Ferroen. "'How dreadful!' said Mercedes, passing a hand across her brow moist with perspiration. "'And that letter!' 
"'I bought it for two hundred thousand francs, madame,' said Monte Cristo. "'But that is a trifle, since it enables me to justify myself to you.' "'And the result of that letter?' "'You well know, madame, was my arrest. "'But you do not know how long that arrest lasted. "'You do not know that I remained for fourteen years "'within a quarter of a league of you in a dungeon in the Chateau d'If.' "'You do not know that every day of those fourteen years "'I renewed the vow of vengeance which I had made the first day, "'and yet I was not aware that you had married Fernand, my calumniator, "'and that my father had died of hunger.' "'Can it be?' cried Mercedes, shuddering. "'That is what I heard on leaving my prison fourteen years after I had entered it, "'and that is why.' On account of the living Mercedes and my deceased father, I have sworn to revenge myself on Fernand, and I have revenged myself. And you are sure the unhappy Fernand did that? I am satisfied, madame, that he did what I have told you. Besides, that is not much more odious than that a Frenchman by adoption should pass over to the English that a Spaniard by birth should have fought against the Spaniards, that a stipendiary of Ali should have betrayed and murdered Ali. Compared with such things, what is the letter you have just read? A lover's deception, which the woman who has married that man ought certainly to forgive, but not so the lover who was to have married her. Well, the French did not avenge themselves on the traitor. The Spaniards did not shoot the traitor. Ali in his tomb left the traitor unpunished, but I, betrayed, sacrificed, buried, have risen from my tomb, by the grace of God, to punish that man. He sends me for that purpose, and here I am. The poor woman's head and arms fell, her legs bent under her, and she fell on her knees. Forgive Edmond! "'Forgive for my sake, who love you still.' The dignity of the wife checked the fervour of the lover and the mother. Her forehead almost touched the carpet when the Count sprang forward and raised her. Then, seated on a chair, she looked at the manly countenance of Monte Cristo, on which grief and hatred still impressed a threatening expression. "'Not crushed at a cursed race?' murmured he, "'Abandon my purpose at the moment of its accomplishment? "'Impossible, madame, impossible!' "'Edmond,' said the poor mother, who tried every means, "'when I called you Edmond, why do you not call me Mercedes?' "'Mercedes,' repeated Monte Cristo, "'Mercedes! "'Well, yes, you are right. "'That name has still its charms, and this is the first time for a long period that I have pronounced it so distinctly. Oh, Mercedes, I have uttered your name with the sigh of melancholy, with the groan of sorrow, with the last effort of despair. I have uttered it when frozen with cold, crouched on the straw in my dungeon. I have uttered it consumed with heat, rolling on the stone floor of my prison. Mercedes, I must revenge myself. For I suffered fourteen years, fourteen years I wept, I cursed. Now I tell you, Mercedes, I must revenge myself. The Count, fearing to yield to the entreaties of her he had so ardently loved, called his sufferings to the assistance of his hatred. Revenge yourself then, Edmund, cried the poor mother. "'but let your vengeance fall on the culprits, on him, on me, but not on my son.' "'It is written in the good book,' said Monte Cristo, "'that the sins of the fathers shall fall upon their children to the third and fourth generation, "'since God himself dictated those words to his prophet. "'Why should I seek to make myself better than God?' "'Edmond!' continued Mercedes, with her arms extended towards the Count. "'Since I first knew you, I have adored your name, 
have respected your memory. Edmond, my friend, do not compel me to tarnish that noble and pure image reflected incessantly on the mirror of my heart. Edmond, if you knew all the prayers I have addressed to God for you while I thought you were living, and since I have thought you must be dead, yes, dead, alas, I imagined your dead body buried at the foot of some gloomy tower, or cast to the bottom of a pit by hateful jailers, and I wept. What could I do for you, Edmond, besides pray and weep? Listen, for ten years I dreamed each night in the same dream. I had been told that you had endeavoured to escape, that you had taken the place of another prisoner, that you had slipped into the winding sheet of a dead body, that you had been thrown alive from the top of the Chateau d'If, and that the cry you uttered as you dashed upon the rocks, first revealed to your jailers, that... They were your murderers. Well, Edmond, I swear to you, by the head of that son for whom I entreat your pity, Edmond, for ten years I saw every night every detail of that frightful tragedy, and for ten years I heard every night the cry which awoke me shuddering and cold, and I too, Edmond, oh, believe me, guilty as I was, Oh, yes, I, too, have suffered much. Have you known what it is to have your father starved to death in your absence? cried Monte Cristo, thrusting his hands into his hair. Have you seen the woman you love giving her hand to your rival while you are perishing at the bottom of a dungeon? No, interrupted Mercedes, but I have seen him whom I loved on the point of murdering my son. Mercedes uttered these words with such deep anguish, with an accent of such intense despair, that Monte Cristo could not restrain a sob. The lion was daunted, the avenger was conquered. "'What do you ask of me?' said he. "'Your son's life? Well, he shall live!' Mercedes uttered a cry which made the tears start from Monte Cristo's eyes, but these tears disappeared almost instantaneously, for doubtless God had sent some angel to collect them. Far more precious were they in his eyes than the richest pearls of Guzerat and Ophir. "'Oh!' said she, seizing the Count's hand and raising it to her lips. "'Oh, thank you! Thank you, Edmond! Now you are exactly what I dreamt you were, the man I always loved!' "'Oh, now I may say so.' "'So much the better,' replied Monte Cristo, "'as that poor Edmond will not have long to be loved by you. "'Death is about to return to the tomb, "'the phantom to retire in darkness.' "'What do you say, Edmond?' "'I say, since you command me, Mercedes, "'I must die.' "'Die? And why so?' "'Who talks of dying? Whence have you these ideas of death?' "'You do not suppose that, publicly outraged, in the face of a whole theatre, in the presence of your friends and those of your son, challenged by a boy who will glory in my forgiveness as if it were a victory, you do not suppose that I can for one moment wish to live. What I most loved after you, Mercedes, was myself, my dignity.' and that strength which rendered me superior to other men, that strength was my life. With one word you have crushed it, and I die. But the duel will not take place, Edmond, since you forgive. It will take place, said Monte Cristo, in a most solemn tone. But instead of your son's blood to stain the ground, mine will flow. Mercedes shrieked and sprang towards Monte Cristo, but suddenly stopping. Edmond, said she, there is a God above. Since you live and since I have seen you again, I trust to him from my heart. While waiting his assistance, I trust to your word. You have said that my son should live, have you not? Yes, madame, he shall live, said Monte Cristo, surprised that without much more emotion Mercedes had accepted the heroic sacrifice he made for her. Mercedes extended her hand to the Count. "'Edmond,' 
said she, and her eyes were wet with tears while looking at him to whom she spoke. "'How noble it is of you! How great the action you have just performed! How sublime to have taken pity on a poor woman who appealed to you with every chance against her! Alas, I am grown old with grief more than with years, and cannot now remind my Edmond by a smile or by a look of that Mercedes whom he once spent so many hours in contemplating. Ah, I believe me, Edmond, as I told you, I too have suffered much. I repeat, it is melancholy to pass one's life without having one joy to recall, without preserving a single hope. But that proves that all is not yet over. No, it is not finished. I feel it by what remains in my heart. Oh, I repeat it, Edmond. What you have just done is beautiful. It is grand. It is sublime. Do you say so now, Mercedes? Then what would you say if you knew the extent of the sacrifice I make to you? Suppose that the Supreme Being, after having created the world and fertilized chaos, had paused in the work to spare an angel the tears that might one day flow for mortal sins from her immortal eyes. Suppose that when everything was in readiness, and the moment had come for God to look upon his work and see that it was good. Suppose he had snuffed out the sun and tossed the world back into eternal night. Then, even then, Mercedes, you could not imagine what I lose in sacrificing my life at this moment. Mercedes looked at the Count in a way which expressed at the same time her astonishment, her admiration and her gratitude. Monte Cristo pressed his forehead on his burning hands, as if his brain could no longer bear alone the weight of its thoughts. Edmond, said Mercedes, I have but one word more to say to you. The Count smiled bitterly. Edmond, continued she, you will see that if my face is pale, if my eyes are dull, if my beauty is gone, if Mercedes, in short, no longer resembles her former self in her features. You will see that her heart is still the same. Adieu, then, Edmond. I have nothing more to ask of heaven. I have seen you again, and have found you as noble and as great as formerly you were. Adieu, Edmond. Adieu, and thank you. But the Count did not answer. Mercedes opened the door of the study, and had disappeared before he had recovered from the painful and profound reverie into which his thwarted vengeance had plunged him. The clock of the Invalide struck one when the carriage which conveyed Madame de Morcerf away rolled on the pavement of the Champs-Élysées, and made Monte Cristo raise his head. "'What a fool I was!' said he not to tear my heart out on the day when I resolved to avenge myself. End of chapter 89 Chapter 90 The Meeting After Mercedes had left Monte Cristo, he fell into profound gloom. Around him and within him, the flight of thought seemed to have stopped. His energetic mind slumbered, as the body does after extreme fatigue. "'What?' said he to himself, while the lamp and the wax lights were nearly burnt out, and the servants were waiting impatiently in the ante-room. "'What? This edifice which I have been so long preparing, which I have reared with so much care and toil, is to be crushed by a single touch, a word, a breath? Yes, this self of whom I thought so much, of whom I was so proud, who had appeared so worthless in the dungeons of the Chateau d'If, and whom I had succeeded in making so great, will be but a lump of clay to-morrow. Alas! it is not the death of the body I regret, for is not the destruction of the vital principle, the repose to which everything is tending, to which every unhappy being aspires, 
Is not this the repose of matter after which I so long sighed, and which I was seeking to attain by the painful process of starvation when Faria appeared in my dungeon? What is death for me? One step farther into rest, two, perhaps, into silence. No, it is not existence, then, that I regret, but the ruin of projects so slowly carried out, so laboriously framed. Providence is now opposed to them. When I most thought it would be propitious, it is not God's will that they should be accomplished. This burden, almost as heavy as a world, which I had raised and I had thought to bear to the end, was too great for my strength, and I was compelled to lay it down in the middle of my career. Oh, shall I then again become a fatalist, whom fourteen years of despair and ten of hope had rendered a believer in providence? And all this, all this because my heart, which I thought dead, was only sleeping, because it has awakened and has begun to beat again, because I have yielded to the pain of the emotion excited in my breast by a woman's voice. Yet, continued the Count, becoming each moment more absorbed in the anticipation of the dreadful sacrifice for the morrow which Mercedes had accepted, yet it is impossible that so noble-minded a woman should thus through selfishness consent to my death when I am in the prime of life and strength. It is impossible that she can carry to such a point maternal love, or rather delirium. There are virtues which become crimes by exaggeration. No, she must have conceived some pathetic scene. She will come and throw herself between us, and what would be sublime here will there appear ridiculous. The blush of pride mounted to the Count's forehead as this thought passed through his mind. Ridiculous? repeated he, and the ridicule will fall on me. I? Ridiculous? No, I would rather die. By thus exaggerating to his own mind the anticipated ill-fortune of the next day to which he had condemned himself by promising Mercedes to spare her son, the Count at last exclaimed, "'Folly, folly, folly, to carry generosity so far as to put myself up as a mark for that young man to aim at. He will never believe that my death was suicide, and yet it is important for the honour of my memory, and this surely is not vanity but a justifiable pride. It is important the world should know that I have consented by my free will to stop my arm, already raised to strike.' and that with the arm which has been so powerful against others I have struck myself. It must be. It shall be. Seizing a pen, he drew a paper from a secret drawer in his desk and wrote at the bottom of the document, which was no other than his will, made since his arrival in Paris, a sort of codicil clearly explaining the nature of his death. "'I do this, oh my God!' said he, with his eyes raised to heaven, as much for thy honour as for mine. I have during ten years considered myself the agent of thy vengeance, and other wretches like Morcef, Donglar, Villefort, even Morcef himself, must not imagine that chance has freed them from their enemy. Let them know, on the contrary, that their punishment, which had been decreed by Providence, is only delayed by my present determination. And although they escape it in this world, it awaits them in another, and that they are only exchanging time for eternity. While he was thus agitated by gloomy uncertainties, wretched waking dreams of grief, the first rays of morning pierced his windows, and shone upon the pale blue paper on which he had just inscribed his justification of providence. It was just five o'clock in the morning, when a slight noise like a stifled sigh reached his ear. He turned his head, looked around him, and saw no one, but the sound was repeated distinctly enough to convince him of its reality. He arose, and quietly opening the door of the drawing-room, saw Hady, who had fallen on a chair, with her arms hanging down, and her beautiful head thrown back. 
She had been standing at the door, to prevent his going out without seeing her, until sleep, which the young cannot resist, had overpowered her frame, wearied as she was with watching. The noise of the door did not awaken her, and Monte Cristo gazed at her with affectionate regret. She remembered that she had a son, said he, and I forgot I had a daughter. Then shaking his head sorrowfully, Poor Heidi, said he, she wished to see me, to speak to me, she has feared or guessed something. Oh, I cannot go without taking leave of her, I cannot die without confiding her to someone. He quietly regained his seat, and wrote under the other lines, I bequeath to Maximilian Morel, captain of Spahi, and son of my former patron, Pierre Morel, ship-owner at Marseilles, the sum of twenty millions, a part of which may be offered to his sister Julia and brother-in-law Emmanuel, if he does not fear this increase of fortune may mar their happiness. These twenty millions are concealed in my grotto at Monte Cristo, of which Bertuccio knows the secret. If his heart is free, and he will marry Heidi, the daughter of Ali Pasha of Yanina, whom I have brought up with the love of a father, and who has shown the love and tenderness of a daughter for me, he will thus accomplish my last wish. This will has already constituted Heidi heiress of the rest of my fortune, consisting of lands, funds in England, Austria, and Holland, furniture in my different palaces and houses, and which without the twenty millions, and the legacies to my servants, may still amount to sixty millions. He was finishing the last line when a cry behind him made him start, and the pen fell from his hand. Hady, said he, did you read it? Oh, my lord, said she, why are you writing thus at such an hour? Why are you bequeathing all your fortune to me? Are you going to leave me? I am going on a journey, dear child, said Monte Cristo, with an expression of infinite tenderness and melancholy, and if any misfortune should happen to me. The Count stopped. Well? asked the young girl, with an authoritative tone the Count had never observed before, and which startled him. Well, if any misfortune happened to me, replied Monte Cristo, I wish my daughter to be happy. Hady smiled sorrowfully and shook her head. "'Do you think of dying, my lord?' said she. "'The wise man, my child, has said, "'It is good to think of death.' "'Well, if you die,' said she, "'bequeath your fortune to others, "'for if you die I shall require nothing.' And taking the paper she tore it into four pieces and threw it in the middle of the room. Then... The effort having exhausted her strength, she fell not asleep this time, but fainting on the floor. The Count leaned over her and raised her in his arms, and seeing that sweet pale face, those lovely eyes closed, that beautiful form motionless, and to all appearance lifeless, the idea occurred to him, for the first time, that perhaps she loved him otherwise than as a daughter loves a father. "'Alas!' murmured he, with intense suffering, I might, then, have been happy yet. Then he carried Hady to her room, resigned her to the care of her attendants, and returning to his study, which he shut quickly this time, he again copied the destroyed will. As he was finishing, the sound of a cabriolet entering the yard was heard. Monte Cristo approached the window, and saw Maximilian and Emmanuel alight. Good, said he, it was time and he sealed his will with three seals. A moment afterwards he heard a noise in the drawing-room, and went to open the door himself. Morel was there. He had come twenty minutes before the time appointed. "'I am perhaps come too soon, Count,' said he, "'but I frankly acknowledge that I have not closed my eyes all night, nor has any one in my house. I need to see you strong in your courageous assurance to recover myself.' Monte Cristo could not resist this proof of affection. He not only extended his hand to the young man, but flew to him with open arms. "'Morel,' said he, 
it is a happy day for me to feel that i am beloved by such a man as you good morning emmanuel you will come with me then maximilian did you doubt it said the young captain but if i were wrong i watched you during the whole scene of that challenge yesterday i have been thinking of your firmness all night and i said to myself that justice must be on your side or man's countenance is no longer to be relied on but morel albert is your friend simply an acquaintance sir you met on the same day you first saw me yes that is true but i should not have recollected it if you had not reminded me thank you morel then ringing the bell once look said he to ali who came immediately take that to my solicitor it is my will morel when i am dead you will go and examine it what said morel you dead yes must i not be prepared for everything dear friend but what did you do yesterday after you left me i went to tortoni's where as i expected i found beauchamp and jette renault i own i was seeking them why then all was arranged listen count the affair is serious and unavoidable did you doubt it no the offence was public and everyone is already talking of it well well i hope to get an exchange of arms to substitute the sword for the pistol the pistol is blind have you succeeded asked monte cristo quickly with an imperceptible gleam of hope no for your skill with the sword is so well known ah who has betrayed me the skilful swordsman whom you have conquered and you failed they positively refused morel said the count have you ever seen me fire a pistol never well we have time look monte cristo took the pistols he held in his hand when mercedes entered and fixing an ace of clubs against the iron plate with four shots he successfully shot off the four sides of the club at each shot morel turned pale he examined the bullets with which monte cristo performed this dexterous feat and saw that they were no larger than buckshot it is astonishing said he look emmanuel then turning towards monte cristo count said he in the name of all that is dear to you i entreat you not to kill albert the unhappy youth as a mother you are right said monte cristo and i have none these words were uttered in a tone which made morel shudder you are the offended party count doubtless what does that imply that you will fire first i fire first oh i obtained or rather i claimed that we had conceded enough for them to yield us that and at what distance twenty paces a smile of terrible import passed over the count's lips morel said he do not forget what you have just seen the only chance for albert's safety then will arise from your emotion i suffer from emotion said monte cristo or from generosity my friend to so good a marksman as you are i may say what would appear absurd to another what is that break his arm wound him but do not kill him i will tell you morel said the count that i do not need entreating to spare the life of monsieur de morcerf he shall be so well spared that he will return quietly with his two friends while i and you that will be another thing i shall be brought home no no cried maximilian quite unable to restrain his feelings as i told you my dear morel monsieur de morcerf will kill me morel looked at him in utter amazement but what has happened since last evening count the same thing that happened to brutus the night before the battle of philippi i have seen a ghost and that ghost told me morel that i had lived long enough 
Maximilian and Emmanuel looked at each other. Monte Cristo drew out his watch. "'Let us go,' said he. "'It is five minutes past seven, and the appointment was for eight o'clock.' A carriage was in readiness at the door. Monte Cristo stepped into it with his two friends. He had stopped a moment in the passage to listen at a door, and Maximilian and Emmanuel, who had considerately passed forward a few steps, thought they heard him answer by a sigh to a sob from within. As the clock struck eight, they drove up to the place of meeting. "'We are first, said Morel, looking out of the window. "'Excuse me, sir,' said Baptistin, who had followed his master with indescribable terror. "'But I think I see a carriage down there under the trees.' Monte Cristo sprang lightly from the carriage, and offered his hand to assist Emmanuel and Maximilian. The latter retained the Count's hand between his. "'I like,' said he, "'to feel a hand like this, when its owner relies on the goodness of his cause.' "'It seems to me,' said Emmanuel, "'that I see two young men down there, who are evidently waiting.' Monte Cristo drew Morel a step or two behind his brother-in-law. Maximilian, said he, are your affections disengaged? Morel looked at Monte Cristo with astonishment. I do not speak your confidence, my dear friend. I only ask you a simple question. Answer it. That is all I require. I love a young girl, Count. Do you love her much? More than my life. Another hope defeated, said the Count. Then, with a sigh, "'Poor Hady,' murmured he. "'To tell the truth, Count, if I knew less of you, I should think that you are less brave than you are. "'Because I sigh when thinking of someone I am leaving. "'Come, Morel, it is not like a soldier to be so bad a judge of courage. "'Do I regret life? "'What is it to me, who have passed twenty years between life and death? "'Moreover, do not alarm yourself.' Morel, this weakness, if it's such, is betrayed to you alone. I know the world is a drawing-room from which we must retire politely and honestly, that is, with a bow and our debts of honour paid. That is to the purpose. Have you brought your arms? I? What for? I hope these gentlemen have theirs. I will inquire, said Morel. Do, but make no treaty. You understand me. "'You need not fear.' Morel advanced towards Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud, who, seeing his intention, came to meet him. The three young men bowed to each other courteously, if not affably. "'Excuse me, gentlemen,' said Morel, "'but I do not see Monsieur de Morcerf.' "'He sent us word this morning,' replied Chateau Renaud, "'that he would meet us on the ground.' "'Ah,' said Morel, Beauchamp pulled out his watch. "'It is only five minutes past eight, said he to Morel. "'There is not much time lost yet.' "'Oh, I made no allusion of that kind,' replied Morel. "'There is a carriage coming,' said Chateau Renaud. It advanced rapidly along one of the avenues leading towards the open space where they were assembled. "'You are doubtless provided with pistols, gentlemen. Monsieur de Monte Cristo yields his right of using his.' "'We had anticipated this kindness on the part of the Count,' said Beauchamp, "'and I have brought some weapons which I brought eight or ten days since, "'thinking to want them on a similar occasion. "'They are quite new, and have not yet been used. "'Will you examine them?' "'Oh, Monsieur Beauchamp, if you assure me that Monsieur de Morcerf does not know these pistols, "'you may readily believe that your word will be quite sufficient.' "'Gentlemen,' said Chateau Renaud, it is not Morcerf coming in that carriage. Faith, it is France and Debray. The two young men he announced were indeed approaching. What chance brings you here, gentlemen? said Chateau Renaud, shaking hands with each of them. Because, said Debray, Albert sent this morning to request us to come. Beauchamp and Chateau Renaud exchanged looks of astonishment. I think I understand this reason, said Morel. "'What is it?' "'Yesterday afternoon I received a letter from Monsieur de Morcerf, "'begging me to attend the opera.' "'And I,' said Debray. "'And I also,' said Franz. "'And we too,' 
added Beauchamp and Chateaurneau. Having wished you all to witness the challenge, he now wishes you to be present at the combat. Exactly so, said the young man. You have probably guessed right. But after all these arrangements, he does not come himself, said Chateaurneau. Albert is ten minutes after time. There he comes, said Beauchamp, on horseback, at full gallop, followed by a servant. How imprudent, said Chateaurneau, to come on horseback to fight a duel with pistols, after all the instructions I had given him. And besides, said Beauchamp, with a collar above his cravat, an open coat and white waistcoat, why has he not painted a spot upon his heart? It would have been more simple. Meanwhile, Albert had arrived within ten paces of the group formed by the five young men. He jumped from his horse, threw the bridle on his servant's arms, and joined them. He was pale, and his eyes were red and swollen. It was evident that he had not slept. A shade of melancholy gravity overspread his countenance, which was not natural to him. "'I thank you, gentlemen,' said he, "'for having complied with my request.' I feel extremely grateful for this mark of friendship. Morel had stepped back as Morcerf approached, and remained at a short distance. And to you also, Monsieur de Morel, my thanks are due. Come, they cannot be too many. Sir, said Maximilian, you are not perhaps aware that I am Monsieur de Monte Cristo's friend. I was not sure, but I thought it might be so. So much the better. The more honourable men there are here, the better I shall be satisfied. Monsieur Morel, said Chateau Renaud, will you apprise the Count of Monte Cristo that Monsieur de Morcerf is arrived, and we are at his disposal? Morel was preparing to fulfil his commission. Beauchamp had meanwhile drawn the box of pistols from the carriage. Stop. Gentlemen, said Albert, I have two words to say to the Count of Monte Cristo. "'In private?' said Morel. "'No, sir, before all who are here.' Albert's witnesses looked at each other. Franz and Debré exchanged some words in a whisper, and Morel, rejoiced at this unexpected incident, went to fetch the Count, who was walking in a retired path with Emmanuel. "'What does he want with me?' said Monte Cristo. "'I do not know, but he wishes to speak to you.' Ah, said Monte Cristo, I trust he is not going to tempt me by some fresh insult. I do not think that such is his intention, said Morel. The Count advanced, accompanied by Maximilian and Emmanuel. His calm and serene look formed a singular contrast to Albert's grief stricken face, who approached also, followed by the other four young men. When at three paces distant from each other, Albert and the Count stopped. "'Approach, gentlemen,' said Albert. "'I wish you not to lose one word of what I am about to have the honour of saying to the Count of Monte Cristo, for it must be repeated by you to all who listen to it, strange as it may appear to you.' "'Proceed,' said the Count. "'Sir,' said Albert, at first with a tremulous voice, but which gradually became firmer. I reproached you with exposing the conduct of Monsieur de Morcerf in Epirus. For guilty as I knew he was, I thought you had no right to punish him. But I have since learned that you had that right. It is not Fernand Mondego's treachery toward Ali Pasha which induces me so readily to excuse you, but the treachery of the fisherman Fernand towards you, and the almost unheard of miseries which were its consequences. And I say, and proclaim it publicly, that you were justified in revenging yourself on my father, and I, his son, thank you for not using greater severity. Had a thunderbolt fallen in the midst of the spectators of this unexpected scene, it would not have surprised them more than did Albert's declaration. As for Monte Cristo, his eyes slowly rose towards heaven with an expression of infinite gratitude. He could not understand how Albert's fiery nature, of which he had seen so much among the Roman bandits, had suddenly stooped to this humiliation. 
he recognized the influence of Mercedes, and saw why her noble heart had not opposed the sacrifice she knew beforehand would be useless. "'Now, sir,' said Albert, "'if you think my apology sufficient, pray you give me your hand. Next to the merit of infallibility which you appear to possess, I rank that of candidly acknowledging a fault. But this confession concerns me only. I acted well as a man, but you have acted better than man. An angel alone could have saved one of us from death. That angel came from heaven. If not to make us friends, which, alas, fatality renders impossible, at least to make us esteem each other. Monte Cristo, with moistened eye, having breast and lips half open, extended to Albert a hand which the latter pressed with a sentiment resembling respectful fear. Gentlemen, said he, Monsieur de Monte Cristo receives my apology. I had acted hastily towards him. Hasty actions are generally bad ones. Now my fault is repaired. I hope the world will not call me cowardly for acting as my conscience dictated. But if any one should entertain a false opinion of me, added he, drawing himself up as if he would challenge both friends and enemies, I shall endeavour to correct his mistake. "'What happened during the night?' asked Beauchamp of Chateaurneau. "'We appear to make a very sorry figure here.' "'In truth, what Albert has just done is either very despicable or very noble,' replied the baron. "'What can it mean?' said the Bray to France. "'The Count of Monte Cristo acts dishonourably to Monsieur de Morcerf and is justified by his son?' Had I ten Yaninas in my family, I should only consider myself the more bound to fight ten times. As for Monte Cristo, his head was bent down, his arms were powerless, bowing under the weight of twenty-four years' reminiscences. He thought not of Albert, of Beauchamp, of Chateaurneau, or of any of that group, but he thought of that courageous woman who had come to plead for her son's life, to whom he had offered his, and who had now saved it by the revelation of a dreadful family secret, capable of destroying forever in that young man's heart every feeling of filial piety. Providence still, murmured he, now only am I fully convinced of being the emissary of God. End of chapter 90 Chapter 91. Mother and Son The Count of Monte Cristo bowed to the five young men with a melancholy and dignified smile, and got into his carriage with Maximilien and Emmanuel. Albert, Beauchamp, and Chateaurenaud remained alone. Albert looked at his two friends, not timidly, but in a way that appeared to ask their opinion of what he had just done. "'Indeed, my dear friend,' said Beauchamp first, who had either the most feeling or the least dissimulation. "'Allow me to congratulate you. This is a very unhoped-for conclusion of a very disagreeable affair.' Albert remained silent and wrapped in thought. Chateau Renaud contented himself with tapping his boot with his flexible cane. "'Are we not going?' said he, after this embarrassing silence. "'When you please,' replied Beauchamp. Allow me only to compliment Monsieur de Morcerf, who has given proof today of rare chivalric generosity. Oh, yes, said Chateau Renaud. It is magnificent, continued Beauchamp, to be able to exercise so much self control. Assuredly, as for me, I should have been incapable of it, said Chateau Renaud, with most significant coolness. Gentlemen, interrupted Albert. I think you did not understand that something very serious had passed between Monsieur de Monte Cristo and myself. Possibly, possibly, said Beauchamp immediately, but every simpleton would not be able to understand your heroism, and sooner or later you will find yourself compelled to explain it to them more energetically than would be convenient to your bodily health and the duration of your life. May I give you a friendly counsel? Set out for Naples, The Hague, or St. Petersburg, 
calm countries, where the point of honour is better understood than among our hot-headed Parisians. Seek quietude and oblivion, so that you may return peaceably to France after a few years. Am I not right, Monsieur de Chateaurneau? That is quite my opinion, said the gentleman. Nothing induces serious duels so much as a duel forsworn. Thank you, gentlemen, replied Albert with a smile of indifference. I shall follow your advice, not because you give it, but because I had before intended to quit France. I thank you equally for the service you have rendered me in being my seconds. It is deeply engraved on my heart, and after what you have just said, I remember that only. Chateau Renaud and Beauchamp looked at each other. The impression was the same on both of them, and the tone on which Morcerf had just expressed his thanks was so determined that the position would have become embarrassing for all if the conversation had continued. "'Good-bye, Albert,' said Beauchamp suddenly, carelessly extending his hand to the young man. The latter did not appear to arouse from his lethargy. In fact, he did not notice the offered hand. "'Good-bye,' said Chateau Renaud in his turn, keeping his little cane in his left hand and saluting with his right. Albert's lips scarcely whispered, "'Good-bye.' But his look was more explicit. It expressed a whole poem of restrained anger, proud disdain, and generous indignation. He preserved his melancholy and motionless position for some time after his two friends had regained their carriage. Then suddenly— Unfastening his horse from the little tree to which his servant had tied it, he mounted and galloped off in the direction of Paris. In a quarter of an hour he was entering the house in the Rue du Helder. As he alighted, he thought he saw his father's pale face behind the curtain of the Count's bedroom. Albert turned away his head with a sigh, and went to his own apartments. He cast one lingering look on all the luxuries which had rendered life so easy and so happy since his infancy. He looked at the pictures, whose faces seemed to smile, and the landscapes which appeared painted in brighter colours. Then he took away his mother's portrait, with its oaken frame, leaving the gilt frame from which he took it black and empty. Then he arranged all his beautiful Turkish arms, his fine English guns, his Japanese china, his cups mounted in silver, his artistic bronzes by Fouchere and Barry, examined the cupboards and placed the key in each, threw into a drawer of his secretary which he left open all the pocket money he had about him, and with it the thousand fancy jewels from his vases and his jewel boxes. Then he made an exact inventory of everything, and placed it in the most conspicuous part of the table, after putting aside the books and papers which had collected there. At the beginning of this work, his servant, notwithstanding orders to the contrary, came to his room. "'What do you want?' asked he, with a more sorrowful than angry tone. "'Pardon me, sir,' replied the valet. "'You had forbidden me to disturb you, but the Count of Morcerf has called me.' "'Well,' said Albert, "'I did not like to go to him without first seeing you.' "'Why?' "'Because the Count is doubtless aware.' that I accompanied you to the meeting this morning. It is probable, said Albert. And since he has sent for me, it is doubtless to question me on what happened there. What must I answer? The truth. Then I shall say the duel did not take place? You will say I apologized to the Count of Monte Cristo. Go. The valet bowed and retired, and Albert returned to his inventory. As he was finishing this work, the sound of horses prancing in the yard and the wheels of a carriage shaking his window attracted his attention. He approached the window and saw his father get into it and drive away. The door was scarcely closed when Albert bent his steps to his mother's room, and no one being there to announce him, he advanced to her bedchamber, and distressed by what he saw and guessed, stopped for one moment at the door. As if the same idea had animated these two beings, Mercedes was doing the same in her apartments that he had just done in his. Everything was in order—laces, dresses, jewels, linen, money, 
all were arranged in the drawers, and the countess was carefully collecting the keys. Albert saw all these preparations, and understood them, and exclaiming, "'My mother!' he threw his arms around her neck. The artists who could have depicted the expression of these two countenances would certainly have made them a beautiful picture. All these proofs of an energetic resolution, which Albert did not fear on his own account, alarmed him for his mother. "'What are you doing?' asked he. "'What were you doing?' replied she. "'Oh, my mother!' exclaimed Albert, so overcome he could scarcely speak. "'It is not the same with you and me. You cannot have made the same resolution I have, for I have come to warn you that I bid adieu to your house and, and to you.' "'I also,' replied Mercedes, "'am going, and I acknowledge I had depended on your accompanying me, for I deceived myself.' "'Mother,' said Albert with firmness, "'I cannot make you share the fate I have planned for myself. I must live henceforth without rank and fortune, and to begin this hard apprenticeship I must borrow from a friend the loaf I shall eat until I have earned one. So, my dear mother,' I am going at once to ask France to lend me the small sum I shall require to supply my present wants. You, my poor child, suffer poverty and hunger. Oh, do not say so. It will break my resolutions. But not mine, mother, replied Albert. I am young and strong. I believe I am courageous. And since yesterday I have learned the power of will. Alas, my dear mother, some have suffered so much and yet live and have raised a new fortune on the ruin of all the promises of happiness which heaven had made them on the fragments of all the hope which god had given them i have seen that mother i know that from the gulf in which their enemies have plunged them they have risen with so much vigour and glory that in their turn they have ruled their former conquerors and have punished them no mother from this moment i have done with the past and accept nothing from it, not even a name, because you can understand that your son cannot bear the name of a man who ought to blush for it before another. Albert, my child, said Mercedes, if I had a stronger heart, that is the counsel I would have given you. Your conscience has spoken when my voice became too weak. Listen to its dictates. You had friends. Albert, break off their acquaintance. But do not despair. You have life before you, my dear Albert, for you are yet scarcely twenty-two years old, and as a pure heart like yours wants a spotless name, take my father's. It was Herrera. I am sure, my dear Albert, whatever may be your career, you will soon render that name illustrious. Then my son returned to the world still more brilliant because of your former sorrows, and if I am wrong, still let me cherish these hopes, for I have no future to look forward to. For me the grave opens when I pass the threshold of this house. "'I will fulfil all your wishes, my dear mother,' said the young man. "'Yes, I share your hopes. The anger of heaven will not pursue us, since you are pure and I am innocent. But since our resolution is formed, let us act promptly.' Monsieur de Morcerf went out about half an hour ago. The opportunity is favourable to avoid an explanation. "'I am ready, my son,' said Mercedes. Albert ran to fetch a carriage. He recollected that there was a small, furnished house to let in the Rue de Saint-Père, where his mother would find a humble but decent lodging, and thither he intended conducting the countess. As the carriage stopped at the door, and Albert was alighting, a man approached and gave him a letter. Albert recognized the bearer. "'From the Count,' said Bertuccio. Albert took the letter, opened and read it, then looked round for Bertuccio, but he was gone. He returned to Mercedes with tears in his eyes and heaving breast, and without uttering a word he gave her the letter. Mercedes read, "'Albert,' While showing you that I have discovered your plans, I hope also to convince you of my delicacy. You are free. You leave the Count's house, and you take your mother to your home, 
But reflect, Albert, you owe her more than your poor noble heart can pay her. Keep the struggle for yourself, bear all the suffering, but spare her the trial of poverty which must accompany your first efforts, for she deserves not even the shadow of the misfortune which has this day fallen on her, and providence is not willing that the innocent should suffer for the guilty. I know you are going to leave the Rue Elder without taking anything with you. Do not seek to know how I discovered it. I know it. That is sufficient. Now listen, Albert. Twenty-four years ago I returned proud and joyful to my country. I had a betrothed, Albert, a lovely girl whom I adored, and I was bringing to my betrothed a hundred and fifty louis, painfully amassed by ceaseless toil. This money was for her. I destined it for her, and knowing the treachery of the sea, I buried our treasure in the little garden of the house my father lived in at Marseilles, on the Allée de Meillan. Your mother, Albert, knows that poor house well. A short time since I passed through Marseilles, and went to see the old place, which revived so many painful recollections, and in the evening I took a spade and dug in the corner of the garden where I had concealed my treasure. The iron box was there. No one had touched it. Under a beautiful fig tree my father had planted the day I was born, which overshadowed the spot. Well, Albert, this money which was formerly designed to promote the comfort and tranquillity of the woman I adored, may now, through strange and painful circumstances, be devoted to the same purpose. Oh, feel for me, who could offer millions to that poor woman, but who return her only the piece of black bread forgotten under my poor roof since the day I was torn from her I loved. You are a generous man, Albert, but perhaps you may be blinded by pride or resentment. If you refuse me, if you ask another for what I have a right to offer you, I will say it is ungenerous of you to refuse the life of your mother at the hands of a man whose father was allowed by your father to die in all the horrors of poverty and despair. Albert stood pale and motionless to hear what his mother would decide after she had finished reading this letter. Mercedes turned her eyes with an ineffable look towards heaven. "'I accept it,' said she. "'He has a right to pay the dowry, which I should take with me to some convent.' Putting the letter in her bosom, she took her son's arm, and with a firmer step than she even herself expected, she went downstairs. End of chapter 91 Okay, be honest with me. Did you come close to tears at the end of our last chapter? I choked up. I didn't actually cry. I don't know if I would have choked up as much if this had been another scene between Edmond and Mercedes. The letter I thought was beautiful and fitting and really interesting. Because I think in a, a modern telling of this story, I just get the sense that the, the author would have had the, the Count hand over, you know, gemstones and tons of money. And as Ken said, there's every reason to believe that as the Count of Monte Cristo, he is, he is funding a smuggling ring and making money, not just living off of his fortune. I had never thought of that, and it makes perfect sense, because he's no dummy, and he knows that that honor among thieves thing has really worked out for him in the past. And, you know, good old Jacopo probably is living large because of him. Got a boat, got a living, some job security, it's all good. But I, I just, I cannot, I cannot lose the feeling that a modern writer would just have, have had the Count fund her and Albert, just, you know, wads of cash, go and have a good life. I won't be there with you, but go and don't depend on the fortune that was so ill-gotten. I think there's something really lovely about Mercedes' pride 
and her sense of honor and decorum. And it really speaks well of her, I think, as a, a character going back to her roots, just as much as the fact that Edmund had every opportunity to dig up that money and didn't. Which also, I think, indicates that there's this tiny, tiny shred of hope that he had had that's gone now and he's okay. And did you notice that for the first time he talked about Aide as his daughter, as his child? This, this person who he's referred to as a slave and she's kind of an ornament and it always felt a little uncomfortable the way that he, he had talked about her in the past. But now I think we're, we're starting to see the armor not so much break as expand to let in some light, which is a good thing, I think. But it also means that we now have, uh, in short order, what, in, in the course of a month, we have seen the end of Caterus, the real end of Caterus, the symbolic slash financial slash societal fall of Fernand. We have seen Albert become a man and such an honorable way for him to deal with the situation that he put himself in. And I love that it, after it's like, wow, okay, so no fight. And the count accepts this apology that came out of nowhere and everybody leaves. And now it's just Albert and his friends standing around and Beauchamp's response is, well, that came out better than I thought it would. <laughs> I laughed out loud when I was listening the first time. I love that. It's like, well, yes, yes, it did. But not really so much better for Albert. And yet, as the son of Mercedes, his instinct was to also get out of Dodge, sure. But get out of Dodge and not take any ill-gotten gains with him which leaves him with precious little of course because he doesn't really do anything or have an income i don't know how he's going to make a living but i'm sure he doesn't know either but we did get some interesting revelations in our chapters today uh, one emmanuel is still alive and well there's julie there's emmanuel julia's maximilian's sister emmanuel it's her husband they are the only happy couple that the Count encounters during his time here. We now have Maximilian has spilled the beans in that he has told Monte Cristo that there is somebody he's sweet on. He hasn't said who, so that's still a TBA. We also learned that Bertuccio knows how to get to and get stuff out of the grotto on Monte Cristo on the island. I don't remember us knowing that but it explains a lot about their relationship and how close they are and how much time they must have spent traveling together first to get to a point where Edmond felt like he could trust Bertuccio with that information. But also that explains why he is able to look at Bertuccio and say, do you have that property that I asked you to get in Normandy? Yes. Did you appoint it the way you know I want it to be appointed? Yes. Did you get the boats? Yes. You know, there's nothing is left to chance because everything is left to Bertuccio. There was also one reference, which I knew wasn't going to be particularly important. It wasn't going to stop you from understanding the story, but there was something that I thought was kind of interesting and it shows how it, it demonstrates character wise, how forward thinking Edmond is technologically. I mean, he's, he has certainly taken advantage of technology. We've seen him uh, befriend telegraphs, early telegraphs. We've, we know that he outfitted his boat, the, the first boat that he had made for himself, uh, with the, you know, the best of the best at the time. So it was very, so he's, a, he's an early adopter. The other thing he's been an early adopter of is guns. There's a reference right at the beginning of chapter 89 where he talks about having a pistol that uses a cap now when i was growing up cap guns cap pistols were uh kid pistols that had little plastic cartridges and at the bottom of that was a little tiny amount of gunpowder and when you 
quote unquote, fired the gun, the hammer would go back against that tiny little plastic cap with a little tiny bit of gunpowder in it and make it go pop. There are also versions of this that had little tabs of paper that had just enough gunpowder in a blister pack in the middle of that tab of paper that you could feed through where the hammer would come down. That's all modern kid stuff. Actual firearm information, and I'm, I'm linking to uh, one page for you in case you're interested in this. Firearms, as you probably know, were muzzle loaded for a really long time where you had to pour in, pour in your powder, put in your wadding, put in your musket ball, tamp the whole thing down. Don't point it at your face as you're doing this, just in case. Put the tamping rod back, aim and fire. <laughs> if you've seen that scene from Glory, you know that this is not something you can do super fast. When I talked to the guys at Washington Crossing, I think he said with the regular old muskets, they could get off three shots a minute, I think. And they only went like 250 yards. You had to be really close. And then when the Kentucky long guns came into play, it's not very efficient. So it turns out that there's a reference to a copper percussion cap, which is exactly what you're thinking it is. It's the casing, the bullet casing. It's the thing that's left behind on CSI when they come to a crime scene. The bottom of that cap where you see, if you look at it, you see it's round and you see a circular indentation in the bottom of that cartridge. The bullet, obviously, if you find it on the ground, is missing because it's been fired. You have the empty shell. That's the cartridge. And at the bottom of that would have been the percussion cap. It would have been the place where the gunpowder was, just like loading a musket, except it's all preloaded for you. So a copper percussion cap was sort of mentioned, kind of, sort of, in an 1814 patent application. However, that was it. It wasn't really mentioned again until 1823, but it apparently had been in use from 1814, 1815, 1816. Real percussion cap guns, guns that were designed to be loaded with pre-made units, complete units, bullet, gunpowder, cartridge, the whole bit. Those came out in 1826. The Delvin service rifle was invented in 1826 as well. The Robert rifle was invented by well, it's Robert, a gunsmith in Paris. And the percussion cap system of ignition became part of service weapons in 1843. So Edmund having a pistol that fired a bullet using a preloaded cap meant he was not going to misfire. There was not a chance that like Andrew Jackson and his 17,000 duels or Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, or like the duels alluded to in, in Hamilton with uh, him and Aaron Burr, but also all the other people that they had dueled with, um, there was no chance of a misfire. Uh, that was one way that you could really easily get out of killing your opponent. In Hamilton, he talks about uh, throwing away your shot, pointing your gun in the air, not taking the shot. The count was not going to miss. The count was not going to to have a misfire. And I love the description of what a marksman he was. Because, wow, yikes. I also loved that in the middle of all of these very, very tense chapters, we have that moment early on where we hear Mercedes' dream, her very, very accurate dream of what had happened to Edmond when he was in prison. It was beautiful. It's heartbreaking. But these were good, good chapters, right? I needed to give you all of these. We needed to get to the point where Mercedes and Albert are able to leave with some self-respect and the respect of Monte Cristo. I do feel like Monte Cristo and Mercedes are awfully hard on Mercedes because as we know from every other piece of literature that we've ever read, uh, women alone are in danger financially as well as physically and not getting married and waiting for a guy from whom there has been no news 
for 14 years. Seems like a long shot to me. Seems like you're playing kind of dangerous, fast and loose with your future. Fernand was an unknown quantity. She had no idea that he'd been involved in getting rid of Monte Cristo. Charming, charming man, I'm sure. She also clearly had no idea what had happened with Ali Pasha and uh, Aide and her mom. But I think it's, it's awfully harsh to blame Mercedes for being weak after 14 years. I mean, I know she didn't get married after 14 years. She got married before the end of that. But still, knowing how women's lives went back then, I tend to cut her, cut her some slack. But I, I think Dumas has it play out this way for a reason. And as we continue through the book, it gets clearer and clearer why. All right. Have a great week. I will bring you more fantastic chapters next week. And don't forget to visit Katie's website, embodyfocus.com slash bliss. Go take a look at her Bliss Day download and then take a good long think about working with her. If you're stuck, if you're needing to get out of the rut, because we've all been in ruts, and get some creative perspective from not just Katie and Rianne, but some really, really smart people. It's probably not a bad idea to take a look and book an appointment to talk to her more. Don't forget that Katie's offer only lasts through the end of July. So if you're not listening in real time, I'm sorry. I'm putting posts up on Instagram and Facebook as well and, and hoping that I can get to you that way. All right, you take care of yourselves. I will talk to you in a week. Have a great week. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.